I'm Reed. This is Crowland Publishing, and welcome back to our Halloween series of videos. And today is a folklore Thursday video in which we take concepts from ritual, legend, social custom, and apply them to our TTRPG and our DD games. And we've been doing Halloween themes for the last month, and this is on guising the use of ritual costume and trick or treating. And I should just say, before we get too far, there's going to be a lot of um, very, very cool images in this particular video. So if you just watch uh, videos like I do, like playing video games and stuff, just have a glance up occasionally because there's some really fantastic uh, visuals in this particular one. Anyway, guising, let's get to it. Now, everyone knows that on Halloween, you dress up as a monster and it should be a monster. And you go door to door and you ask for treats. Sometimes you might sing for your supper. Sometimes you might do a little play. But this is an ancient ritual called guising. Now, our notions of trick-or-treat and Halloween begin in societies around the huge mountain range in Europe called the Alps. And they're also cold and dark. And in winter, it's very, very cold and very, very dark. And if the summer don't come, you die. If the winter is too harsh, you die. So they took this notion of magically involving themselves in bringing back the sun and making winter not too harsh quite seriously. Now, I should just say also, before we get too far, most of the pictures here are by a man called Charles Frager, French guy. Check him out. Uh, and why don't you give me a like and a subscribe? Because I also will die in the winter if I don't get some more likes and subscribes. Now, Samhain, the basis for Halloween, and in fact, all pagan festivals really, have a few purposes. And what's germane here is that Samhain is to fend off spirits of the dead and the elves who come out of the dark. And part of how you deal with them, part of how you actually defend your community, is to guise, is to dress up so scary that demons and elves and fairies and spirits go, ah, yikes lads, we've made a mistake, let's get out of here. Now over the years, trick-or-treating gets mixed up with things like mumming. Mummers are people who go around and do little plays or sing songs door-to-door -door for cakes and wine and things like that, which is probably the real origin. There's also wassailing, which is um, slightly more religious in the way that we think about it, version of trick-or-treating. Now, lots of things happen when you are in these uh, crazy costumes and we've done another video on masks and masks are interesting because they give people a license to act in ways that are outside of social convention and sometimes in some cultures trick-or-treating is more menacing than just knock on the door and like oh look at the lovely little children i'll give them some chocolate it's more a give us sweets or we'll do something bad to you because we are devils it's a kind of controlled menace it's a way to shake up the status quo and another part that we don't really see a lot of today is dancing. Heathens loved to dance and do big performances and big rituals. And performance and ritual were at the heart of Halloween. And so, therefore, is trick or treating. Plays uh, put on as acts of ritual magic. Dances to scare people are made so that you feel the correct emotions. Maybe you perform a ritual sacrifice, which might have been a wicked man, but is more likely to just be you set an effigy on fire. This is how you demonstrate the myths of the gods and how they relate to you personally and as an individual. Trick-or-treating is about the correct supernatural behavior and is ultimately an act of magic to defend against the forces of darkness. Now, there's a few more examples of this. Uh, the Perkton Pagan Festival in Germany is a celebration of the pagan goddess of Perkta. You put on particularly scary costumes for those ones and you wear bells so that kids know to avoid you. And then the young men, because this is often quite gendered, you don't have to do that in your games, obviously, but it just is. Uh, so the young men would dress up in these terrifying costumes and go looking for ghosts and spirits. So they would actually try and beat up. If that sounds like it routinely got out of control, well, of course it did. Still does. Latvia was famously the last country in Europe to Christianize and has a lot of well-recorded pagan history. So their May Day, which is a little bit different than Halloween, obviously, but it has a big deal of dressing up in flowers. Young men jump naked into warm lakes. But the winter solstice, Zemus, is much more of a dark pagan festival than you might see in a film. You dress strangely, and you chase evil spirits, of course, but also you dance for fertility because more kids meant more workers, uh, and it was just a blessing from God so that you wanted large families. And more importantly, after a night of safe, mediated terror, you could break with the year and move forward because you were not going to experience a darker night than the one that you had just lived through so you were celebrating your survival through the darkest night of the Eastern European winter. Now, these costumes are of particular interest in narrative games because they have ritual magical power, which is something that players tend to want. 
And they hint at the witch cult hypothesis, which is a notion that ancient great mother religions existed in, in the ancient times, which is historically untrue, but fantastic for game narratives. Uh, a great example of this is the straw bears. Their origins are debated, but if you look up on the screen, I'll put some up there now. Straw bear origins are debated. Uh, probably it's because people used to capture and chain up bears, poor bears, and lead them around town. Or perhaps it was a way of dressing up as and becoming the wild man, the wood was a kind of personification of the wilderness. And the straw bears would be ritually thrown out of town, as we would ritually expel winter. And this is very interesting, straw bears show up from England to Russia. And of course there's Krampus, everyone's favourite. And we find these devil figures as well, all throughout Europe. They dramatise evil and misfortune and they operate to show you that you can and you should be scared of the powers of darkness, that there are consequences to immorality. Animal geysers are also very common. Animals are obviously vitally important to European historical life. They loom large in the imagination. So you tend to have hobby horses. They're very, very common. And of course, the Mary Lou, the uh, undead horse skull on a stick that would go around dancing and singing in uh, parts of Wales. My favorite, though, is the Battalisk. He's sort of a good holy goat uh, in a Spanish uh, town. So they would ritually capture him, give him a feast, and everyone would tell the goat about the gossip that the neighbors had, and he would repeat it back, so as it would clean out the town's accumulated tensions and resentments. Now, I should just also say, before we go on, that costumes do things to people. If you've ever cosplayed or know any cosplayers, they'll talk about this. The ritual of dressing up and acting out it's very powerful. It takes people outside themselves. And the name that we have for this is Invocation, and it is absolutely well known to ritual magic. People dress up in robes and hoods to do spells for a reason. So, I'll stop myself there. I'll go on about this for hours. But what do we need, therefore, for a good trick-or-treat Halloween-themed particular adventure? We need a big ritual performance. We need cool costumes. We need... Uh, an attempt to hold back the forces of darkness, and we need a break with normal social custom. Uh, I think that we can easily get five good adventure hooks out of this, so let's go. Number one, sewing and making clothes is a very specialized skill, and to a pre-industrial society, a really valuable one, and creating ritual costumes even more so. So the adventure would be that you have to locate a very special tailor, or seamstress, or whoever, to find, to commission, to make magical costumes to defeat the devil. And of course, then you're going to need to go and find various items. You might need bassless scales, you might need cockatrice blood, you might need unicorn hair, whatever. But ultimately, is that you're looking to create a very magical ritual garb to confront the devil with. Costumes coming alive. It's an old trope, but it's a great one, and probably one you haven't played around with in D&D. Say that you've got a town, they're having a little festival, they all dress up as owl bears, but a local wizard or puckish fae or whatever casts polymorph, and suddenly you have a small town with 50 owl bears running around, or lizard men or whoever, and you can't kill these people, you in fact must protect them or capture them until dawn. So there's a fun kind of more comedic one-off, and also you can't actually really do violence, which is always a good break from traditional D&D. Number three, your PCs are hired to dress up in costumes and hunt down the evil spirits. A taut adventure, but not only are you going up into old attics, creak, creak, what's that? Abandoned church basements, creak, creak, <laughs> you hear something in the distance. Standing stones up on the ancient hill, and there you're hunting down shadows and whites and wraiths and specters. And you're also looking to protect the townsfolk who might not have the ritual costumes that you do or might not have been able to make it into town, who are very much a danger of the dark powers. I've done an adventure like this, and I said that if their costumes were damaged, the uh, monsters would have to do double damage to them or always have advantage on them or something like that. And it made the PCs act a lot more protectively. So if you're looking for a good, tense, more horror -y kind of feeling adventure, something like that. Number four, the local dignitary's kid goes out guising and he never returns. So what happened to the poor wee bairn? A simple investigation mission, no big deal. And it reveals that a terrible cult is operating in town and they prey on the innocent and they are serving up to a fairy queen who lives out in the forest prized to children. And I think that the notion that the fairies have come into town and have actually quietly subverted your guising ritual could be really, really fun. As is the slow realization that players have that looking around the town of people filled with uh, weird costumes and outrageous horns and feathers and hair and stuff like that. And then someone eventually figures it out. Not everyone is in costume. Number five, 
So the local trick-or-treat is the ancient remnant of a ritual that offers up gifts to and takes blessings from five or seven or three or however many ancient spirits or demigods who live in local grottos, barrows, altars, trees, those sorts of places. And the players are commissioned to, in just one night, find and locate those ancient pagan holy sites and offer them up gifts and give blessings for the community in return. However, this is an ancient rite and the local inquisitors really don't think that you should be going out and waking up the ancient pagan powers. So not only are you walking through like a spirit and weird, creepy monster infested woods, a whole bunch of guys with quite a fondness for fire are chasing you as well. So anyway, there you go. Guising, trick or treating. I think that you could get a hell of a lot of ground out of this for a cool, interesting Halloween themed D&D game. I'm Reed. Again, please give us a share and subscribe. Tell your friends as well. Word of mouth can really, really help me out. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time. Have a good Halloween.